Hello folks, uh, this is Dr. Matt Moynihan here doing a lecture on uh, oral history of nuclear fusion research. This lecture is going to be on ICF, inertial confinement fusion research, which is a bear of a topic uh, and considered one of the two leading approaches for fusion in the world, the other one being Tokamax. And of course, many would argue that Tokamax really just is the fu leading fusion research approach. Um, but it's just one chapter in my book. So ICF um, is a huge topic, and this is just to give you a high-level brief overview of the topic. There are many more detailed resources you can get on this topic. Um, it, it derives its uh, mechanics from a fusion-fission bomb, what Edward Teller called a super bomb. Uh, and a super bomb, it, it's a two-compartment bomb. The compartment one has plutonium, that is fissioning and breaking apart and releasing a ton of energy. It releases X-rays, which are then reflected and deflected back into a second chamber that has tritium and deuterium fusion fuel. And the X-rays compress the second pellet uh, uh, in a fusion fuel, causing a fusion reaction. So it essentially boosted boosts the destructive energy released in the bomb. Uh, and so the second compartment is a capsule of fusion fuel being compressed by a wave of x-rays that have been generated by the fission driver, if you think about that. So uh, are there ways to test the, that, those physics in the laboratory? Uh, and more importantly, to get around a comprehensive test ban treating that uh, the Russians and the United States signed during the Cold War. Well, it turns out there is. You can do the same effect with laser beams. You can take a solid target of deuterium and tritium or deuterium uh, uh, hydrogen uh, that's frozen at like, you know, 20 to, below 20 degrees above zero. So like 15 Kelvin, 16 Kelvin, 17 Kelvin, something like that. And you can put it in the middle of a big laser chamber and fire laser beams at it uh, or x-rays. If that's what you want to do, you could do x-rays too. And when the lasers or x-rays or light beams hit the surface of the frozen target, there is an explosion of energy outward and an equal and opposite compression wave inward that compresses the material down to a temperature and pressure where fusion can occur. That's the basic concept of ICF. ICF was invented almost immediately after the laser was invented. So 1960, 61, around that time frame, uh, the laser comes out and then within six months, folks at Livermore realized that they can use this to simulate and mimic in a laboratory the physics of a fusion uh, nuclear bomb, essentially. Uh, and But uh, I should say, even though the program started in 1960, it was highly, highly classified. Um, Ralph Moyer, who's a friend of mine and a senior scientist at Livermore, tells a story from graduate school in the 50s. And he said that they would take a lecture on the in physics of fusion-fission bombs. And uh, it, everyone was asked to put away their notebooks. Every, everyone was asked to leave the room, except for the few people that were there for the lecture. Uh, and they would write classified on the board. And then Edward Teller would get up and draw the double chamber fusion fission bomb. And uh, that stuff was classified at the time. It was classified research. Uh, regardless, um, the initial work was from 1960 to 1972. Uh, headquartered at Livermore National Laboratory, uh, developing laser systems for compression uh, of targets. Now, the first systems were tabletop systems, uh, and there's a whole series of laser systems that Livermore builds during that time period. Four-path, uh, Cyclops, Shiva, Long Path. Uh, these were all uh, tabletop or room-sized laser systems uh, where a laser beam was generated and then it was bounced off a whole bunch of optics on a light table and goes into a mini, mini, miniature target chamber uh, at the other end of uh, the room. And they were studying basic LPI, laser plasma interactions, which is the, the field of study around which, you know, you ask questions like, how well does the laser light couple to the target? 
How much energy from the beam gets into the target? How well does the shock perform? What ways can we change or modify or twist or tweak or otherwise innovate to improve the quality of this compression system? Um, this, these things all took place in super secret classified environments. Now, uh, when it became apparent to Livermore that this was not going to work uh, directly or very easily, they needed to make more, um, more of a statement nationally about this. So in 1972, John Nichols uh, was able to publish the first publicly available paper on ICF and ignition. And it was a four-page paper that you can look up uh, that's now famous in the ICF field because it's the first paper where they really articulate publicly um, all the mechanics that I just described. And uh, it was only four pages, which is kind of amazing, given that today a landmark paper in nature would be, you know, dozens of pages with tons of data uh, and would be fought for and carefully written out and worked on by multiple teams of people. Back then, this was John Nichols just spelling out some math and somehow he got in nature and somehow it became a famous paper because it was the start of a huge uh, international or national program in, within the United States. So in John Nichols' 1972 nature paper, which is considered the first paper in the ICF field, um, he spells out what it would take to get ignition. So what is ignition? Ignition is an important concept in ICF. It's essentially fusion chain reactions. You have a fusion event that generates a hot helium uh, particle or an alpha particle that normally would just jet away from the plasma at ultra high speeds, about 3 million uh, electron volts, and it would just fly away and, and smash into the wall. But in the situation of ignition, uh, that particle stays around and is contained in a dense enough plasma that it will bump into something and drop its energy back into the plasma, therefore, therefore causing secondary fusion reactions. Secondary fusion reactions, aka fusion chain reactions. Fusion chain reactions are what in ignition is and uh you know that was laid out in 1972 and uh, we didn't see the first evidence of that until august 8 2021 so almost 50 years later <laughs> from when nichols publishes his paper we actually saw the first laboratory evidence of this event occurring um so he laid it out you know using some basic math and some basic physics laid out the concept of ignition and argued in that paper that, hey, this could be used for fusion power uh, because we have this way to essentially amplify. We put in, you know, five units of laser energy. We get one unit of, of fusion energy to start with, but that causes a secondary fusion reaction that's cascading. And this amplifies the power output above five and we have net power and we can make a power plant off of this. Um, he predicted at the time a laser that was a thousand joules or one megajoule laser system could do the work uh, pretty, pretty boldly uh, with some basic math and basic physics arguments. Um, and he, he laid out what I described earlier about the compression force. So the, the shock, um, when you have the ICF implosion, you have lasers exploding on the outside, an equal and opposite compression wave inward. That compression wave is doing work, PV work, pressure times volume uh, work, pressure volume work, almost like a piston compressing um, air and heating up as it compresses. That's what's compressing the, the material. And so ICF uh, was off to the races. Um, the uh, Livermore produced a series of laser systems. Some of them I mentioned previously, uh, Cyclops, Long Path, Shiva, these all got progressively larger. Uh, Argus, um, these are all through the, the 70s into the in early 1980s. By uh, the 1980, they had built Nova, which was a huge, uh, like, football field size um, laser system. Uh, and these laser systems got quite elaborate. They were built inside clean rooms at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, and... Um, they had very extensive optics. So the optic sizes are, you know, 12 inches, 14 inches size optics. 
And a typical laser system might have a thousand optics um, that would uh, create the whole um, effect. Um, about that time, uh, in 1972, uh, the Laboratory for Laser Energetics is founded at the University of Rochester. So Livermore has a program. The University of Rochester has a program. There are other programs around the country. And at the same time, there's also at Sandia this pursuit to try to do the same thing with ion beams, beams of electrons, beams of ions, beams of protons, beams of high Z material. Uh, that's all going on simultaneously. So all these things are happening concurrently, and it's also the time uh, during the Carter administration when oil crisis is going on. So you've got weapons reasons for doing this, right, which I already mentioned. You've got energy reasons for doing this, which I already mentioned. And you've got Cold War reasons for doing this, which I've already mentioned. The United States had to do this before the Russians did this. So there's a lot of good reasons for the federal government to fund not just one, but multiple ICF programs and ICF research efforts at multiple different locations around the country, and also explore different ideas, not just lasers, but x-rays and, and uh, particle beams. So what comes out of that is a lot of momentum around ICF. Uh, th there's different approaches that evolve uh, then and since then through the decades. So for instance, there's direct drive, which is where laser beams strike the target directly. And the target itself is uh, a frozen ball of deuterium tritium, or it could be a glass shell, or it could be a solid object with a bubble of deuterium tritium gas in the center. Um, that's direct drive. There's also indirect drive, which is where the laser beams hit a gold foil, which creates a X-ray which then compresses the target. Now, you, the x-ray, the second step, adding that step, intermediary step, uh, creates benefits and consequences, good things and bad things. Like for instance, a good thing is, these x-rays are essentially bathing the target. So they're kind of more uniform and they're more uh, complete in compression. Bad part is uh, you lose some energy along the way, right? Because every time you take a step, a physical step, you know, for example, converting electrical energy to laser energy, laser energy to x-rays, x-rays to compression. You lose a little energy every step you go. So <clears throat> pluses and minuses, direct drive, indirect drive. Those two schools of thoughts kind of form early. Um, uh, fusion and ICF moves forward, and I can describe one laser facility just to give you a flavor for how it works. Um, the Rochester Omega facility they had um 24 they had 12 beams then they had 24 beams then they had 48 beams then they went to 60 beams now in each case they start with a seed beam a single laser beam and you can imagine it to be about a foot long uh, of energy and that beam goes into a splitter so it gets split twice and then gets split three times and then gets split four times so two times three is six times four is uh, 24 uh, beams. And so that that's like, like the Omega 24 system. Um, now, I want to say also that doing it this way ensures that the, the, the light has the same amount of time to get from the start to the finish because the path length, the length of the laser beam has to travel is the same amount because you can't change the speed of light. So if you want to make sure that all the light reaches the target at the end of the day, at the same time, it has to travel the same amount of distance. That's path length. So that's why these laser systems are set up like this, where they have one beam that's split into two, that's split into three. Um, now, over time, the laser glass that's used to amplify the beam gets better. The optics get better to focus and disperse the beam. The um, mirrors that reflect the beam get better uh, and uh, the targeting, the target centering get better. All this technology kind of improves in tandem and you get all sorts of great spinoff technology like laser weapons, laser guided missiles, um, laser applications for um, circuitry design, uh, PowerPoint lasers, you know, lasers that you have in, in classrooms and other things. All of these systems are coming out of the ICF program. It's an absolutely wonderful jewel of the American Research Institution. It's kind of an unsung hero of the U.S. research economy. And 
it's all related to weapons research or energy research. So from a congressional point of view, if you're a Democrat, you can support it because you like fusion energy and you like science. If you're a Republican, you can support it because you want American weapon systems to be excellent and top notch. So one of the early accomplishments in the ICF program that I want to talk about is pulse chirping amplification. And this was a breakthrough that happened at the University of Rochester in the 1980s. Uh, Donna uh, Sutherland, please forgive me if I got that name wrong. She was the one who uh, invented this concept as a, a PhD student. And it was excellent because it kind of got around a roadblock that all laser systems were encountering where they could only build up so much energy in the laser beam. They couldn't go much further than a certain sort of threshold. Donna's approach was pretty innovative. What she did was she took one laser beam at one color or one wavelength, say red, and then split it into all the colors of the rainbow by running it through a, a basically a prism. You can think of it like a prism. So it splits from red to green, yellow, red, purple, orange, um, you know, white, um, well, well, not white, but all these different colors. And then you would amplify the a laser beam at each wavelength of light. So you could pump in more energy through each wavelength of light. And then you recombine all the beams at the other side and it comes back out as a super powerful red beam. And by doing this, this pulse amplification approach, they essentially got around a fundamental limit with how powerful the laser beam could be. Um, and furthermore, they did things like triple amplification and other, other cool uh, innovations to increase the power of the laser beam. So uh, Omega went through an upgrade in the 1990s, and then about 95, uh, the ICF community comes together to start pushing for the National Ignition Facility. Now, the case for the National Ignition Facility starts uh, like in the late 80s, really. Um, there was a experiment done, super secret classified experiment called Halide and Centurion, where they did underground missile uh, or weapons testing to prove and measure the amount of x-rays required to get ignition on a target. So essentially using a nuclear bomb to verify the quality and quantity of x-rays on target uh, as a way to justify what it would take to build this uh, in a laser facility called NIF. Uh, that was one of the first uh, uh, pieces of data that they used. Uh, beyond that, they, they made some upgrades using the chirp pulse amplification and made a single NIF beam to show that they could build this at Livermore. Jonathan Lindell did a tour de force publication uh, in 1995-96, where he basically, over, uh, I don't know, maybe 90 pages of text, goes through every single technology that would require, um, would be required and would be developed uh, for the National Ignition Facility. So that was the scientific thrust. And then uh, folks at Livermore were doing advocacy. Mike Campbell was a big advocate. Uh, they were doing a lot of government relations and government interfacing with congressional staff to try to build support for the National Ignition Facility. On the, the National Ignition Facility and the Department of Energy side, there were they were receptive. Uh, folks like Steve Coonan uh, at DOE were res receptive to the idea. And at the same time, the funding was also coming from the nuclear National Nuclear Security Administration, which only cares about maintaining the st stockpile of nuclear weapons. But they were receptive to the idea of funding a laser facility at Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, Congress eventually voted yes on the idea and uh the the machine was funded in 1997 construction started in 1997 may 1st 1997 or may 30s 1997 construction for for 12 years and was finished in 2009 uh so 12 years uh a cost of 3.5 billion dollars which isn't a terrible amount of money when you consider how much money is thrown at uh, military weapons systems around uh, the United States. Um, of course, NIF was, of course, controversial. There were voices criticizing the idea inside and outside the nuclear fusion community. 
Uh, and there was also competition between the labs to win funding for NIF. So, for instance, Livermore won the money, but the Naval Research Laboratory lost money because of that, because they were uh, re- redirecting funnel, uh, funneling money towards Livermore. Los Alamos and Sandia both had their own concepts that they were pushing, but Livermore ultimately won the day and got the money uh, to build NIF. Uh, and then outside the fusion community, there was criticism from a uh, a group called Tri Valley Cares, which was an activist group that was claiming that uh, the National Issue Facility was a bad idea and that it would support the weapons complex and it there was pollution issues and other things. So this got funded uh, and uh, they started work. Uh, it was a, a 12 year process. When I was in graduate school, uh, this was the most exciting thing that was going on in the ICF world. Uh, by that time, uh, uh, University of Rochester had developed cryogenic targets. Uh, so they implemented a whole system where they took deuterium or deuterium tritium and froze it in a two to three millimeter size uh, spherical shell on the end of a carbon nanotube or carbon fiber um, stalk, essentially. Uh, and they could freeze it in a, a chamber, a cold, cold chamber or a vacuum chamber. And it was a very ex- exciting and interesting process that got perfected over time. Uh, and they worked through a lot of technical issues. Like, for instance, they'd have ice crystals that would form that would change the internal structure of the target and make it non-uniform for compression. Uh, or they'd work through other issues like uh, melting and reheating uh, was another problem in the cryogenic target space. Um so it was a very exciting uh, target design. This, by the way, was after they had shot a variety of other targets. So a modern laser facility like Omega or the National Ignition Facility is a user-driven facility. Uh, what happens is uh, scientists from around the world at other institutions at Princeton, Oxford, University of Colorado, uh, University of Michigan, etc., would uh, write a proposal that says, I want to study... Um, let's say, a block of lead at uh, extreme densities and temperatures. And I want to measure the thermal conductivity of lead that would be ex- in existence at the center of the sun, that kind of thing. So they write this proposal, they submit it, they go through a review process, uh, and then if it's approved, then they get their shot time, and they get scheduled you know, six to eight months in advance or 10 months in advance or a year in advance, Uh, And then they develop their target to uh, to study that specific approach. So this is a scientific experiment where they have access to this extreme laser system or laser tool. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, we're going to put the target in there like a block of, you know, metal. And we're going to zap it with laser beams. It's going to create the plasma. And we're going to measure something off of that. And we're going to get our data and be able to calculate something we want to calculate. And so that's part of uh, what ICF use laser facilities are. They're doing these extreme matter condition experiments, or they're doing fusion experiments, or they're doing uh, some other weapons related experiments. So if you look at who uses the facility, it's broken up pretty evenly between some national lab folks, some weapons people, some academic people, and some people that are strictly interested in fusion power plants. And that's the kind of thing that's been going on uh, at ICF facilities around the country for, you know, the last couple decades. And as you can imagine, there's all kinds of different targets, the, the thing that goes in the center of the laser system that can get fired on this thing. Not just the, the frozen balls of deuterium and tritium, but solid blocks, glass blocks, and other unique uh, ideas. Okay, so... Um, The National Ignition Facility, they promised that they'd get ignition by 2012. uh, And they tried a three-year campaign to basically get there, and they failed to get there. Uh, And when they did that, Congress reduced budgets by 15 to 20%. And that was a really rough year to graduate with a PhD in ICF. And that's that's what happened to me. Uh, Postdocs were not readily available at Livermore, and so I kind of fell off of... uh, the ICF pipeline from grad school to postdoc, postdoc to staff scientist at a national laboratory. Uh, so fast forward nine years, and uh, they now have ignition. As of August of 2021, they have ignition. So what changed over those nine years from when they 
couldn't do it in December of 2012 to successfully doing it in August of 2021. Well, the uh, NIF uh, machine got less complicated for one thing. Uh, at the beginning days, early days of the NIF uh, experiment, um, they really didn't understand the mechanics of the machine. So that would lead to something like, hey, we're going to put in condition X, Y, Z and expect uh, result A. And they'll put in the same condition twice and get different results because the machine was so complicated. The laser hole system was so complicated that you put the same results, you put the same inputs in, you get the different outputs, which breaks a fundamental rule of science, right? Where you conduct experiments, they have to be controlled experiments. And NIF wasn't doing that. Uh, at the in the early days, NIF was doing different things with the same inputs, uh, and that's a that's a really tough problem to solve, and that's why one of the reasons why it took them so many years to improve the quality of the shots and improve the quality of the implosions. Uh, on top of that, they they made a number of other changes. They made the targets. Uh, they got better at the target science and engineering and manufacturing. Um, the targets. I mean, the perfect target is a free floating sphere of deuterium tritium that's perfectly formed that has no weird things on its surface no dust no no imperfections no um divots no um no changes in thickness and it would be free floating in the space and in the center might be some gas of deuterium tritium and then it's perfectly compressed uh by laser systems now to get there is very challenging you got to keep the target clean you got to form the ice correctly you got to do diagnostics on the target to make sure you're in the right place you've got to have some way to hold the target that's not going to interfere with um, the target compression if you've got some sort of glue or something the spot size has got to be very very low and you've got to maintain it also at cryogenic temperatures throughout the formation movement delivery and ultimately the shot itself so the target science itself evolved right along with the laser science and the optic science and everything else and uh, nif got much much better at building targets uh, they also simplified the design in, in the early days in 2009 their first designs were unbelievably complicated for targets i mean the early hole rooms like 2009 2010 2011 had 75 different parts that were all formed through different manufacturing processes like uh, etching or the processes that you would use to make microchips. They essentially eliminated all that stuff. That stuff was all waste. And it was all introducing variability in the process. So by simplifying everything, they got much cleaner, clearer, and it got a much better handle on the variability. Um, additionally, the laser system got better. They, they got more accurate in shaping the laser, targeting the laser, and um, they also got a better understanding of the physics of the compression because they got better diagnostics so they could see what they were doing. Uh, and, and they got better at understanding the efficiency of the laser. So all of these improvements are happening in tandem. And through 2016, 17, 18, um, the quality of the shots get better and better and better. The amount of energy coming off the shots get better and better and better. And then uh, in August of 2021, they get ignition. They get these breakthrough results. I can actually tell a personal story about this. I was on the phone. I was at work on the phone after work uh, in the parking lot with a senior scientist at one of the uh, ICF uh, laboratories. I can't say who it was. We were talking over the phone and they turned around and they said to me, oh, we just got ignition. I said, what? He goes, yeah, it just happened on uh, Sunday morning. And I said, that's not true. He said, it's true. So uh, it was kind of an exciting bit of news. It came uh, about five o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday. Uh, the event had happened on Sunday. So I went back to my computer and started emailing my entire network stating that so-and-so just reported to me that um that they got a huge uh, well his name was <laughs> well it just reported to me that uh we had they had seen large uh outflows of energy and they had seen a huge increase in shot um quality and uh initially i didn't hear anything and then i started getting emails back from multiple people in my network that said yeah in fact this is true 
And uh, the next day on Friday, I was emailing everybody in my universe and sending it out uh, all over the place that, hey, this breakthrough has happened. Uh, but I was watching the news. We didn't get any news. There was nothing in the news about it. Friday, Saturday, and then the story broke, I think, Sunday or Monday of that week. Uh, and it was picked up by um, some large uh, news outlets that, hey, this is a breakthrough in nuclear fusion. And uh, it ultimately came out that 1.3 megajoules of electrical uh, of energy came off the target. 1.3 megajoules, which is an unbelievable record by a factor of six or more. Um, from the previous shots and essentially a breakthrough in ICF physics. So, um, it, are we have we seen ignition? Well, yes, but uh, by textbook definition, no, because uh, they Livermore wanted to see a, a, a gain of one and they calculated a game of 0.7. Uh, they announced that at APS. So by their own definition, they are not saying that they got ignition, even though it's just a matter of semantics at this point. Um, the ICF community is super excited now in uh, November, December of 2021, when I'm making this recording. Um, they are planning on putting together an IFE plan, community-driven plan for IFE power plant. Um, that kind of thing, the kind of talk has happened before when they were building the National Ignition Facility. Livermore launched a PR campaign called LIFE which was a uh, group of people, a group of studies around what it would take to form a power plant using this approach. Um, life worked uh, by dropping targets, blasting them, having the ignited target go into either a wet wall or drywall chamber where uh, the liquid metal or molten metal would capture all the thermal energy uh, and then uh, that could turn steam into t turbines. There was also talk about a fusion-fission hybrid, <clears throat> basically using the neutrons from a fusion reaction to kick off a fission amplifier uh, in a molten salt type thing. So that was sort of like, uh, hey, we'll put in 10 kilojoules or 10 megajoules of energy. We'll get, you know, uh, something like 100 megajoules of fusion energy. And then we'll amplify that to 600 megajoules using some fission uh, salt amplification. So both studies have been looked at before. Uh, Life was a, a, they had a website, a PR campaign, all that. Um, that was all sort of abandoned when NIF failed to get ignition. Uh, and um, Ed Moses, who was the head of Livermore at the time, was sort of canned uh, after that happened because they had to have some head roll, unfortunately. Uh, but Ed Moses was a wonderful uh, scientist and really great at uh, public communication about fusion and, and ICF. And, and sort of Dennis White becomes the next version of that a few years later. Um, so that's well, that's what's going on right now in the IFC, uh, IFE community. So in the private world, there is also uh, several efforts to form ICF-related companies. The most prominent ICF company is a company called First Light Fusion. They were formed in 2011 out of the University of Oxford uh, in England. And their approach was very innovative at the time. What they were doing was saying that, hey, there's this instability that forms when we compress these targets. Um, the instability is called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. There's also an RMI instability, RM instability, which the name I can't pronounce, which is a derivative of Rayleigh-Taylor. What is Rayleigh-Taylor? Rayleigh-Taylor is when a light fluid pushes on a dense fluid, uh, and that surface doesn't compress uniformly. It ripples, it bucks, it breaks. It's non-uniform and it causes problems because the compression is uh, not great. And as a, as a, as a, impact on the reactor, it just destroys the overall performance of your ICF compression system. Uh, so uh, First Light's approach was, hey, we know that Rayleigh Taylor already exists. We've known that for 40 years in ICF, and we've done all this great work um, understanding it and modeling it and measuring it using all these existing 40 years of ICF research from all these different institutions. So as a private company, let's start over with a clean slate and be aware of Rayleigh Taylor from the start. And we'll redesign everything, the driver, the target, uh, the compression scheme around that Rayleigh Taylor instability so that we can get better performance. 
And the other thing we'll do is we'll model it. We'll model it first using all kinds of computer codes that are cheap and easy and simple to run and a great way to sort of test the waters before we build anything. And that was First Light's pitch uh, to investors uh, when they started the company in 2011. So uh, they started this, the, the company with these computer models uh, and they modeled uh, different compression schemes and they rethought everything. They said, well, what if we put you know, a single compression target? Or what if we put some nanoparticles on the thing? Or what if we make our targets out of glass blocks with some bubble of deuterium tritium inside? Uh, let's look at all these different ideas. Uh, let's look at solid pushers. Let's look at railgun solid pushers. So we'll, we'll make the shock wave using a simple solid objects colliding with a, a solid object as opposed to a laser system. Much cheaper, much cheaper to run it with a solid object. I mean, all you need is the shock wave, right? So there's really no need for the laser system necessarily uh, in, in this case or in this argument that they're making. Uh, First Light... Uh, built a whole series of machines. They expanded their staff. They're up to between 60 and 100 people. And they've raised uh, almost 100 million or over 100 million pounds uh, through various Series A, Series B, Series C rounds. Uh, they had some supporters. Uh, Parkwalk Associates was one of their supporters uh, that gave them a few million in seed and then later more money. Uh, and they had some uh, advisors from within the ICF community. Uh, they had uh, some folks at Oxford that were professors there that were involved in mechanical engineering. They also grabbed Stephen Chu, uh, who is the former Department of Energy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, and they had him on the advisory board. Uh, they built a series of machines, Machine 1, Machine 2, Machine 3, Machine 4. Uh, this is like circa 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, that time frame. Uh, machine 4 was a, a six rail gun system that they built for like three to four million pounds. It was in a star pattern uh, and it was rail guns that were firing solid objects at uh, targets. The targets uh, were super secret classified stuff. I don't even know what they looked like. Um, but they were, I imagine they were something like blocks of material with bubbles or chambers filled with uh, fusion fuel and then solid objects, projectiles coming in to make the compression uh, wave. Um, uh, the, you know, the Stargun railgun system was a series of supercapacitors that were creating almost like an electromagnetic magnetic launch system that would launch solid objects at uh, the target system that had the fusion fuel in it. Um, the most recent update from uh, First Light is, that I have from 2020, 2021 timeframe is they made a very long high powered rail gun. So instead of making six, they made one and they were testing the, the strength of that for something very specific. Uh, so uh, the question is, did they run into problems and they have to switch to this other experimental machine that has an exceedingly long lead up and, and can uh, project particle, uh, solid objects at much, much higher speeds to get around some issue or flaw that they saw at low temperatures or, or low speeds. I don't know. They haven't published in a big way or they haven't presented in a big way at conferences like APS, TPP, or in any major uh, plasma physics journals. I think that the lack of publishing is always a very bad idea. Uh, in fusion, you don't want to repeat the past. You don't want to make the same mistakes again. You don't want to repeat something that someone already tried. And when fusion teams don't publish because they want to be secretive or because they think they're protecting some IP or because they, their investors are demanding it of them or their management structure, it hurts everybody. It limits the, the growth of this field. Uh, so for instance, right now, there are two other very interesting ICF programs, uh, private companies, I should say, that are currently looking uh, at this technology. One of them is Innovin out in uh, Colorado and, and California. Uh, there's a Robert Hunter who worked at uh, the Carter administration. He was a sort of a policy wonk uh, and high level um, official uh, who led uh, a series of companies, uh, most recently a, one for many, many years, more than 20, 20 years, and then founded Innovin in 2010, and it was under stealth mode for many, many years. 
Uh, they filed patents and they've raised some seed funding. I don't know a lot more about them. Uh, but so Innovin's out there. And then the other one is Marvel um, Fusion, which is a German company that's been around for three to four years. Uh, that's funded f- primarily from the BMW uh, family. Folks that were involved in that company that gave seed funding to, to Marvel Fusion. And Marvel is out trying to develop an ICF approach. And there are other teams and folks interested in ICF as a power plant design. Uh, I think that there's a lot of problems uh, making a power plant around ICF. Uh, mainly, you have to mass produce the targets. You have to drop them. You have to shoot them. You have to recover the energy quickly and then do the next target very quickly. I've seen some papers that argue that this has to be many times this, uh, in a minute, uh, multiple times a minute or multiple times uh, every 10 minutes. Uh, regardless of how it goes, uh, that kind of pulse system has inherent problems. It's not continuous. It's not operating straight away. Uh, it doesn't ramp necessarily well. And in laser, if, if you're doing with lasers, there's has to be cool down time. Laser beams go through optics and the optics heat up and the heat ups, uh, you know, have to be relaxed. So you can't just like pulse many, many times in a sim- simple laser system and not expect to have problems uh, the beam will you know get off kilter or something will go through some glass that is partially melted and fly off in the wrong direction uh, and you can, people have proposed hey we can get around this by uh, sending the laser beams into different chambers we'll have multiple chambers but that adds a lot of expensive stuff and if you're moving the lenses around you're going to have alignment issues if you're trying to like actively move lenses while you're shooting stuff with lasers um, there are ways around this, you know, there are more efficient laser systems, of course, the, the Naval Research Laboratory has some of the best coupling of lasers to targets. So their Argus facility, uh, Argon Krypton laser, um, then has some very high efficiencies and it would be good to make an ICF system out of that. But again, ICF has fundamental problems, uh, that other approaches do not have like continuous operation. Um, you know, you can do ICF with these other uh, things like projectiles and rail, rail, rail guns, or sorry, rail guns. Uh, I don't know much about that, but I mean, it, it seems to make sense that it would be simpler, cheaper, better to do it with something other than a laser driver. Um, you got to remember that ultimately ICF as a program was geared around weapon systems. It was funded for weapon systems. It was funded primarily in the United States as a way to stockpile stewardship type stuff. So it has those limitations. Um, the NNSA does not care about fusion energy. They don't want to make uh, programmatic changes or follow their nose or technology into directions that might necessarily lead to IFE or uh, inertial fusion energy, ICF for energy. So that's one of the reasons why um, the program as a whole is kind of off kilter or not uh, where it needs to be for a fusion power plant. Uh, but I'm sure that many folks in the ICF world are going to try to change that or are changing that or have been changing that over the last decades. Uh, so we'll see. So that about sums up the ICF program. I hope you get a, a general overview. Again, this is a much bigger program that can be covered in a half an hour. Uh, there are a lot of nuances and details around each one. Uh, again, there's also... There's more than just the approaches that I mentioned in terms of direct drive, indirect drive. There's also an approach called fast ignition, and there's a shell imploding uh, like compression approach. I'll just briefly talk about those methods. Uh, Fast ignition is a method where you preheat the target with a single pulse, and then you compress it with a second wave. And then the shell compression one is you implode the target, you allow it to expand a little bit and then re reshoot it with the second pulsed beam. So they're both two step processes. And there's other examples like that where they're basically trying to innovate and improve the entire overall compression by testing all these different variations. Um, I would say a lot of the innovations are pretty picked over for ICF. I do get emails from people that say, well, what about covering it with carbon nanotubes or what about covering it with gold nanoparticles or something like that? And the answer often is, hey, we already tried that. We, we, we've tried a lot of things. Uh, there's been a lot of efforts. In particular, the gold, the gold uh, carbon nanotube stuff was in the early 2000s. 
uh, and the high Z gold stuff has been tried a couple different ways. Um, so uh, you wouldn't be surprised. You'd be surprised how many different innovations have been tested over the years around ICF. Uh, but that doesn't mean that someone can't come along with some new idea that'll take it to a new level. Okay. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Take care.